Good afternoon. Welcome to the North Carolina edition of our state webinars, exploring the findings from American Farmland Trust's recently released Farms Under Threat, the State of the States report. Before we get started, let me run through some logistics to help make this a good experience. Everyone has been muted, so no need to do that yourself. If you would like to ask a question or make a comment, look at the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. The orange arrow at the top allows that panel to shrink and reopen. In that control panel, you'll see a questions section. Um, to ask a question, you hit on that square box where it says questions, and over on the right, there's a square box. It decouples it. It opens that and pops that out. You can type in your question, or feel free to type in any comments there as well. Um, we will get to those questions at a couple of points in the webinar. We are also recording the webinar, and we'll send the link to everyone who registered. Um, please feel free to share that recording with others. So. Let me now introduce myself. I am Chris Coffin. I am American Farmland Trust's Senior Policy Advisor. I also direct our newly launched National Agricultural Land Network, which I'll talk about at the end of the webinar. Co-hosting with me is Billy Van Pelt, AFT's Senior Director of External Relations. Billy is based in Kentucky and works throughout the Southeast to increase AFT's visibility and impact in the region. And before I turn it over to Billy, let me give just a little bit of a primer on American Farmland Trust for those of you who are not familiar with us. AFT is a national nonprofit membership organization founded in 1980. Some know us best by our No Farms, No Food bumper sticker. We started as and remain an agricultural land trust, but that is one small part of our work. We are also, de also deeply involved in developing tools to help farmers improve soil health, which in turn improves their bottom line. And we are focused on creating new farm transfer and succession tools and strategies to expand land access opportunities for next generation farmers. Our programming is grounded in research such as this and informs our state and federal policy development and advocacy. So with that, let me turn it over to Billy. Thanks, Chris. We are delighted to be joined today by a number of organizations. We thank you for your interest and partnership. These include the North Carolina Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, the North Carolina Land Trust Federation, USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service, North Carolina State, and the University of North Carolina at Pembroke, North Carolina Farm Link, as well as numerous allied partners from across North Carolina. And now I'd like to introduce a very special guest, DeWitt Hardy, who is the director of the North Carolina Agriculture Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund Program. DeWitt, we are grateful to have you with us this afternoon. We thought we would start by asking you your perspective about farmland loss generally. I have three questions. The first question, why should North Carolina citizens care about farmland loss? Billy, thank you first of all for allowing the Department of Agriculture to be represented on this seminar. And uh, it is a very important question, why should North Carolinians be concerned about farm loss? <clears throat> First of all, you need to look at the state of North Carolina. Farmland is the essential bedrock for existing food and fiber and forest industries in the state. Agriculture and agribusiness, according to Dr. Mike Walden, NC State, accounts for 17% of all, our, uh, all, all the state's gross product or approximately $91.8 billion worth. And also employs 728,000 uh, individuals of uh, the 4.4 million of employees. NC also ranks nationally eighth as the largest state of production as far as among all states in, in the union. It's first, of course, and what's one crop is really known for is tobacco, but it's also known as first in the nation in sweet potatoes. It's second in poultry and eggs. It's second in swine, turkey, and trout. 
It's third in the nation in strawberry production. It's fourth in cucumbers and cantaloupes, fifth in peanuts, squash, and catfish. So we start looking at our state. Soil is very important because it's essential for those products. It's also the land that's farmed is essential for our second largest industry in the state, which is military training. That's $66 billion industry in North Carolina. North Carolina is the home of three of the U.S. Armed Services. He has the U.S. Army at Fort Bragg. He has the MCIA Marine Corps Navy, Camp Luzerne Base, which covers, which is the main headquarters for the Eastern uh, Marine Corps uh, training. Also, U.S. Air Force Base at Seymour Johnson, and also has a Coast Guard base at Elizabeth City. All these are important as far as the training of these fine men, men and women that protect our nation, the land that's around these bases and the military training areas they fly over and train with. Another thing that's important to people in North Carolina is taxes and keeping the economy of the local government going. County property tax, for example, for farmland, for every dollar that is taken in, less than 2%, I mean, less than 50% of that dollar is generally used for any kind of expenditures according to our cost for community services we do on several of our counties. It is also for our tourism, the backbone essentially of the background for our mountains to coast of uh, tourism market. Without the greenery, our state would not be known as a green state and recognized as a good place to come and visit from our mountaintops all the way to our shorelines. So that's a, one of the central reasons why Farmland loss is, is important to every North Carolinian. Thank you, Director Hardy. The next question is how might this report inform the work of the department? Department of Agriculture, we have a farmland preservation uh, division in it, but also through it, there's other aspects from the standpoint of protecting and working the natural resources of our state. This report has been provided by American Farmland Trust provides essential information that is needed for us to make public awareness. This public awareness information is important not only to the farms, but also to every individual of the state, just basically on the economy, economy itself and economics and keeping our state in a well being statue physically. Recognition of the threat and status loss of the natural resources cannot be replaced that cannot be replaced and brought back once changed or was it if we don't protect these natural resources as outlined in the report we will never have them again and they're lost forever it also provides a rallying cry to challenge our partnerships in developing and seeking changes to salvage the remaining working farms and forests for future generations it's our actions today that makes a difference for tomorrow without doing something today we may not have a tomorrow for others to see. The encouragement of federal and state and local policies to be changed or modified to encourage and promote conservation and protection of farms and forests is essential for future generations. This information provided by American Farmland Trust provides that background of documentation needed to help change those policies, protect the land and its limited resources for our working farms and ranches. These policies are need to be prioritized to support our, par, our, our current programs that are in existence. We have currently county farmland protection programs that are provided or, or uh, accepted or adopted by the local county governments called farmland conservation planning. We have our voluntary ag districts and enhanced voluntary ag districts where, where landowners voluntarily set aside their land in a, in a method or, or a mode of existence where they stay in natural settings with farms and forests. We also, from the standpoint of the state and federal funding, it will provide us ability to look at other outways of, of working together in partnership, whether it's on the federal side with military, federal side with USDA, or just in the private sector bringing funds together to help uh, in the placement and the purchase of conservation easement. But most of all, is public policy support by all people in North Carolina. This helps us to do 
from the department standpoints in protecting the resources of our state. Director Hardy, how can the stakeholders on the call today and others across North Carolina help to move some of these findings forward? The most basic thing is education. Education of not only our neighbors and our, home, and our families and our friends, but also the local officials, those who represent us. From the federal and state, our senators and representatives, from organizations like our civic organization, our church organizations, spreading the word, letting our friends and neighbors and everyone know the importance and education, educating them on the importance of farmlands and forests and protecting those natural resources. The next step would be also to demonstrate, become involved, to help be involved by providing one of two things or three things is financial support yourself and, and helping others in this process, providing and participating in activities and workshops, and just giving a helping hand to others around that may need some assistance in trying to promote the programs that protect these vital resources. The other thing is experience it. Visit your local farmer, buy the local food products that are there. Keeping these farmers in place helps protect those soils, helps protect those lands that we all vitally need for the future. Know where your food and fiber is being produced. Look at, look at have, have a knowledge of what is being produced in and around you. Also, know the various types of food products that are producing respected resources requirements to produce those products. But words, have a working knowledge yourself and be comfortable with it, that, that knowledge of where those food products or fiber products are being, are being created and how they're being processed and support the industries that, that make your life more valuable and, more, and have more abundance. Those are some of the main things and this information of American Farmland Trust helps us all understand. Thank you, Director Hardy. We appreciate your thoughtful comments and look forward to engaging the department further around ways to keep farmland in farming. Thank you, sir. Great, now thank I'll you. Go ahead, <laughs> Billy. Um, let me, let me um, come back in. Thank you, Billy. Thank you, Director Hardy. Um, let me now talk about the findings from our Farms Under Threat report. Today, we are focused on the State of the States, which is the second report in this research series. State of the State paints a striking picture of the threats facing working farms and ranches in every state and documents the steps every state has taken to protect their agricultural land base from development. So for State of the States, we used a multi-pronged approach that included advanced spatial mapping to identify the threats to agricultural land and an in-depth analysis of state policy responses. We're using this report, as Director Hardy uh, emphasized, to raise public awareness, to inform state and federal policy, and to encourage more direct and permanent agricultural land protection. Next slide. For those of you who did not join our launch event last month, I want to touch very quickly on our national findings. From 2001 to 2016, a period of historically low um, development, um, the U.S. converted 11 million acres of agricultural land. That's equivalent to all the lands planted in 2017 in the U.S. to fruits, nuts, and vegetables. The majority of that conversion was to, to low-density residential land use, a conversion that is not as visible but poses a significant threat to agriculture. More than a third of the land converted was to what we have identified as nationally significant land, the land best suited for intensive food and crop production. So now we're going to dive into the data available for North Carolina on our interactive website, and Beth is going to help us navigate through here. Um, let me start with pointing out the tab over here, the reports and data tab. 
Um, this is where you'll find the fact sheets that describe much of the methodology used in this report. If you're interested in getting access to the geospatial data we used, you can make a request. Um, you see that geospatial data layers um, down there. It's like the fifth or sixth one down. If you click on that, that will take you to a request form. We will start um, providing those data layers, I believe, sometime in July. Um, so let's go to the drop-down menu now and choose North Carolina. And here you'll see that you can find both the spatial data and the policy scorecard. And before we dig into the spatial data, actually, Beth, if you can show them that download, download the highlight summary um, fact sheet. There you will see that we have created these two-page highlight summaries that we hope will be useful to everybody. It's a way that you can use them to take some of the graphics. All of those graphics are available if you have, say, a magazine that you want to put them in or you want to use uh, social media to include them um, or if you want to download them and use them for education with policymakers or um, just the general public. So know that those are available. There's both one for the spatial data and one for the policy summary. So let's um, let's start with looking at um, the um, land use and cover, if we would, Beth. We've used multiple national data sets to develop the best available spatial inventory of agricultural land in the U.S. You can zoom on this data layer, to, data layer to identify every type of land use in the state, including the types of land conversion. And note that one new feature of our research is that we have spatially identified woodland associated with farms. So let's now turn to the PBR index. And to understand not just the quantity, but the quality of land being converted. We created a first ever assessment of agricultural land quality that specifically accounts for productivity, versatility, and resiliency. This PVR index, which you see here, the darker the green, the more productive the land, was developed in consultation with a national panel of experts. Higher PVR values indicate higher suitability for long-term intensive crop production, especially for food crops such as fruits, nuts, vegetables, and staple grains. We used this PVR index to identify the best land in the country for producing crops, especially human edible food crops. This is land we considered nationally significant, and you can find that in the tab up there as well. In North Carolina, if we can go to that nationally significant data layer, excellent. Um, you can see, I don't know if it's possible, Beth, to reduce it um, uh, to see some of those numbers on the left-hand side of the screen. But you can see in North Carolina that 59% of agricultural land, or about 6 million acres, is considered nationally significant. About 4.7 million acres of this is cropland, with about 500,000 acres of pasture and 800,000 acres of woodland as well. So let's look lastly at conversion. As I mentioned earlier, the time period we analyzed was a short one, 2001 to 2016, and one with a deep recession in the midst. We mapped the conversion of ag land to two types of land use, urban and highly developed land use, or UHD, and low density residential land use, or LDR. UHD includes the traditional culprits in farmland conversion, that's expanding residential, commercial, and industrial areas, but it also includes rural, industrial, and energy production sites. So it picks up oil and gas well pads, as well as solar panel installations. This project is the first of its kind to quantify the extent of large lot housing on the agricultural land base. So low density residential areas range from lower density subdivisions to rural areas where more and more individual houses are being built. All told, North Carolina converted over 731,000 acres. The vast majority of that, 
78% to LDR. Our analysis also showed that Agland in LDR in 2001 was five times more likely to be converted to urban and highly developed land use by 2016 than other agricultural land. So let me stop there and um, turn it back to you, Billy, to give your perspectives on some of what we're seeing with this map on the conversion front. Thanks, Chris. And I think it's the map, uh, a picture says a thousand words. And what we're seeing here, um, not only in North Carolina, but in states across the nation, is that we are seeing smaller cities uh, surrounded by PBR land, productive, versatile, and resilient land uh, that are expanding or that are under threat of development. So if you look across this map, you see Greenville, Goldsboro, uh, Raleigh-Durham, of course, Burlington, uh, Hickory, Mooresville. So you see that these cities are surrounded by PVR land and there's development pressure, there's threat of development, and you have land that's already in conversion along the spectrum of ag land to full urban development. So now is the time to act. Now is the time to implement state policies to protect our most productive, versatile, and resilient soils for the future. Because what we're seeing a pattern of, we're seeing smaller cities and bedroom communities of larger cities that are merging into the larger cities. They are growing together. So you can see that the productive, versatile, and resilient soil between each city is under a great deal of threat. So uh, it's best to act with a suite of tools, which we'll talk about a little bit later, to help contain that growth so that it occurs in a compact, contiguous manner. As it relates to climate change, as we have sea level rise in the future and people begin moving away from the coast, the most productive, versatile, and resilient farmland in North Carolina will be under even greater threat. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Billy. Um, before we move into some of the policy findings, um, we wanted to stop and um, ask folks on the webinar what you see as the biggest conversion threat for North Carolina over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, we're asking this in part because in thinking about what are policy responses, those are different depending on where really see where folks feel that conversion threat is coming from. So there you see the um, choices. You can vote for more than one. And if you're having any trouble voting, go out of the full screen. If you're in full screen mo mode, you might want to get out of it in order to vote before you go back in. So let's give it another minute. Um, see what folks think. Okay, Beth, let's... All right, so I will say that this is um, quite consistent with how folks have voted in other states that we've been doing these webinars that most people believe that the past drivers of conversion will continue to be the next drivers, and that is to say poorly planned, um, uh, more and poorly planned housing, commercial, and industrial development. Um, so let's go then to the policy scorecards. Our intention with the scorecard is to highlight effective elements of state policies that address what we see as the drivers of agricultural land conversion to date. Poorly planned development, um, weak agricultural viability and profitability at, uh, at times, and the fact that land is often most vulnerable when it is transferring between generations. While AFT has been at the forefront of federal and state policy development around farm and ranch land retention and protection since our founding, this is our first effort at a comprehensive state policy scorecard. Um, 
And I would say that we consider it to be comprehensive. We know that it is not comprehensive and that we are not looking at the full range of state policies that focus on agricultural viability and the support of farm businesses. There are many such policies. That would have been truly comprehensive. It's more than we could do, particularly to start out with. We are hoping, we are planning a second iteration of the policy scorecard to pick up some additional state policy types. But the policies that we looked at for the purpose of this first effort was to focus on those that are tied to the land. So we looked at purchase of agricultural conservation easement programs. Um, I think probably virtually everybody on this call knows what those are. It's the voluntary purchase of an easement um, by a county or state program or with in coordination with the land trust. Um, uh, and North Carolina has done this for quite a long time. The second one is land use planning and growth management. These are what we looked at here were policies both at the state level, um, primarily policies at the state level, whether there is support for um, local planning, whether there is a requirement for local planning, whether there's consistency between any state goals and um, local planning and zoning. We looked at property tax relief for agricultural land. As Director Hardy mentioned, our cost of community services say that working farm and forest land requires much less in services than it typically pays in property taxes. And um, accordingly, most all states, in fact, have provided some level of property tax relief for land. We looked at agricultural district programs. Um, North Carolina is one of 18 states that have some type of district program that combine a number of different tools to provide support for farms. Um, and we looked at farm link programs. Importantly here, we looked at only those programs that were either state or authorized or provided significant state resources. We recognize that there are lots of um, uh, non-government farm link programs, but our focus here was on state policy, so only those public farm link programs were included. And state leasing, we looked at um, how focused a state was, if at all, on providing farmers access to state-owned land for the purpose of active agricultural use. So in looking here, you can see the North Carolina scores that um, the state is close to the median score for PACE, for land use planning, for property tax relief, for agricultural districts. You can see that high bar for farm link, given the um, robustness of the North Carolina program, and um, below the median on state leasing. So the website allows you to dive into the factors behind these scores. And we don't have time right, to go through all of them in great detail, but let's take a few. So starting with pace. If you can see, you can pull down, you can pick this, and you can go down and see where North Carolina scores relative to other states. So there's North Carolina coming across the way. You see that North Carolina gets high points for its frequency of its monitoring. It gets a lot of points for the type of the authority and things within that authority that we think it is important for state pace program, whether it's a grant program or the state is doing the purchase itself. Um, where other states have scored higher is because they have typically invested more resources over a longer period of time than it seems that North Carolina has. And quite frankly, some of the ones that have um, the highest scores are in quite small states so that they have a higher percent of their agricultural land that has been protected. And for a larger state like North Carolina, um, that's a challenge. So let's, um, before we go out of pace, I think the one thing to point out, and it's not really reflected in here, but we know that um, North Carolina, with its land trust and its county programs, have made very good use of both um, uh, Department of Defense 
funding for um, protection of land around all of those military installations that uh, Director Hardy talked about, um, and has made some good use of the Agricultural Conservation Easement Ag Land Easement Program. Um, I just point out that the changes in the 2018 Farm Bill, that again, there are many on the phone who contributed to pushing for some of those changes, we think will be helpful to um, provide more funding to North Carolina and other states for the purchase of ag easement. So let's go quickly to land use planning. Um, we understand that land use planning is both a top-down and a, and a bottoms-up approach, and it's actually more a bottoms-up approach, and that the suite of planning tools is critical, tools like urban growth boundaries, ag zoning, large lot minimums, local farmland protection. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to look at is whether there is really state support, support for those kinds of, um, of providing financial support at the county or municipal level to do that type of planning and to see whether there are state goals. And while there is a, and North Carolina gets credit for having a state plan for agriculture, um, the states with high scores have state goals around saving farmland and promoting compact development and then require some consistency with those goals at the community level. Um, high scoring states also provide funding to help with comprehensive planning generally or funding for farmland protection planning specifically. So let's go to the um, ag districts. North Carolina um, does well as um, Director Hardy talked about in terms of the voluntary ag districts and um, uh, and the enhanced voluntary agricultural districts getting again sort of partial credit for a number of um, provisions of those programs and Beth if you would go down to the bottom just again to show folks how we scored things and where uh, states got credit or not so that you see down here the types of authority we were looking for, the types of um, approaches that various states have taken, and that is what's behind many of these scores. Um, and so lastly, let me just recognize again the robust farm link program in North Carolina. Um, I think the reason for why it was not um, at the top of the list on um, approaches was simply because there is no explicit state authorization. I think that's where I noticed that it had um, no points, but otherwise it's very high scoring. Um, so again, let me stop there. We're about to take questions. So if you have questions on either the spatial data or um, policy findings, now is the time to type them in. As we go out of the website, we're going to launch another poll which asks which policy or policies you think would be most valuable to focus on um, in North Carolina right now? And again, this is not a single answer. You can do um, multiple answers here. And if there's not an answer that you think, if we don't have an answer here that you think is relevant, you want to add something in, please put it in the comment section. Okay, Beth, what, show us what people think. Okay, this is great to see. Um, I'm going to talk about the Agricultural Land Network at the end, but just know that we will be hosting a series of policy webinars beginning in early fall, um, which we hope will be a way for those of you who want to learn more about specific policy elements and these questions are helping us figure out um, where the interest lies at the state level so that we can tailor those webinars accordingly. So um, what we wanted to add here is the fact that 
what is missing from our spatial analysis is protected agricultural land. And that is because there's not a comprehensive data layer focused on agricultural land protection specifically. We are building this new database now. Um, and it is great to see all of that green in North Carolina. I would say that if you, have, if you hold agricultural conservation easements and you have not heard from us and not given us your data layer about those easements, please um, let us know by typing that in on the question bar. Um, we will be in touch um, to see if we can get that information from you so we can have as complete a a data layer here as possible. So with that, let me stop and turn it over to Billy, who's been looking at questions. Thank you, Chris. We have a question, and the question is, can you quantify low-density residential land? For example, one house per how many acres? So I will say that there's not um, a single answer, it, but I will say, that there are attributes of low density residential. Uh, the main attribute is that typically they are not agricultural units. So I think you're, you're looking at the McMansions, the um, large lots, large houses on lots that aren't agricultural units. As we say here in Kentucky, uh, they're too much to mow and not enough to grow. Um, but candidly, I think we're looking at one acre, five acres, 10 acres, 15 acres, anything, um, 20 acres, you know, those are, those are really the low density residential um, elements that we're talking about. These could also include in-family conveyances that are carved off the front of the farms uh, for family members, but generally, um, large lot, low density residential development, um, and we'll get to this in a minute, is one of the primary elements when we talk about what needs to happen from uh, how we plan for the future of agriculture. Because, and I'll use Lexington, Kentucky as an example, we had a 10 acre lot minimum from 1964 until 1998. And in the late 90s, we saw that we had lost 4,700 acres to 10 acre lot development, low density residential. And so if we took that 4,700 acres and put it in the center of our urban area, we could have gotten 20,000 typical residential lots, but instead we only got 429. So it was a gross misuse of land. In addition, low density residential typically results in a proliferation of septic tank development, which also negatively impacts our water quality. Great, Billy, let me just add um, a couple of things to that. First, for an explanation of exactly how that low density residential um, land use layer was created, which was via a model that focused on using both um, census housing block data and census of agriculture data, you will find an explanation back when we first went into the website um, and focused on that reports and data tab. So look in there for a more detailed explanation about that. And the other point that I would make about low density residential is that it is um, in what we are saying with this is not that all low density residential land use, um, that there is not agriculture happening, as Billy was just alluding to. There is, but we also appreciate that um, in the long run, that being um, having having to farm around non-farming neighbors gets very challenging. Um, and so while you might see land that is in active agriculture within that LDR data layer, um, the chances and the likelihood that in fact that gets more built up over time is higher and it becomes less hospitable for agriculture generally. Um, so Billy, are there other questions or should we move 
I think we should move on, Chris. Let's move on then. And I believe that's to you. It is. And I, I just want to take this time to highlight that time is not on our side in saving our farm and ranch land, which is why American Farmland Trust just announced a bold goal of doubling the amount of permanently protected farmland by 2040 and reducing the rate of farmland conversion from 2,000 acres a day to 500 acres a day by 2040. To get to this goal, we will all need to lock arms together to collaborate and to partner. So now I'd like to just touch on some of the ways that American Farmland Trust will be strengthening its commitment to farmland protection here in North Carolina. They include establishing the National Agricultural Land Network, providing new leadership in key locations. And this, what this means is American Farmland Trust is letting our science and research um, guide us in locating two new offices in the Southeast. Uh, and we are very excited about that. Uh, we are going to be working to support our existing land trust, PACE and PDR program partners to protect more farmland as uh, a partnership and a collaboration. We want to advocate for stronger state and federal policies and we also want to promote research-based decision-making. So I think that this particular point is very significant because we talked every, most of the um, responses was that there needed to be a stronger focus on land use planning. So using research-based decision-making is critical to land use planning. Typically, the tools in the toolkit for planning for the future in agriculture involve urban growth boundaries, where the urban area is contained in a compact, contiguous way, and you don't have anything that's non-agricultural outside of that boundary. Urban services boundaries have been used in this country since 1958. Uh, the next uh, tool in the toolkit is large lot minimums in your rural area. So those lot minimums um, need to be quantified as what your area uh, knows based on research is a viable agricultural unit and that all of those viable agricultural units form a critical mass for North Carolina's agricultural industries. Next, you want agricultural zoning in your rural area. You want zoning that allows for agricultural uses and ag-related uses, but does not allow non-agricultural uses. And finally, farmland protection programs, PACE programs, purchase of development rights programs, uh, donated conservation easements, working with land trust partners or land trust partners that are perhaps purchasing conservation easements. Those four tools working in concert, working in unison, are examples of good planning for the future of agriculture. But as we move um, into this uh, research in every state, and Farms Under Threat does have a third phase, and this, this is our county level data, which I won't just get into detail today, but as we focus more on individual communities, on cities and counties, each community and each county should have a goal for protected farmland in their county so that there is an agricultural base that is secured for future farming activities, whatever that agricultural use may be. And so that there's a critical mass. So you have community goals, county level goals for farmland protection and a state goal perhaps for farmland protection. And as we like to say, uh, we want the Holstein and not the Dalmatian. We want the Holstein representing large critical masses of protected farmland for the future of agriculture and not uh, isolated pockets 
of conservation that is surrounded by low density residential development, urban development, or other non-agricultural uses. So I'll, I'll just close by saying that everything that we do here at AFT is a partnership. We look forward to working with each and every single one of you. And um, I'll say in terms of what North Carolina can do as we uh, move on to this uh, to a higher level discussion is analyzing all of these uh, trends throughout North Carolina. This is a lot of information that we presented to you today. And we encourage you to read the full report, to read our executive summary, and to also share our spatial and policy summaries with your elected officials, your appointed officials, and those that are, on, are in a position to affect change statewide. Uh, we want, we've already talked about the suite of policies to adopt, um, supporting farm viability and access to land, planning for agriculture, not just around it. And you know, as we as we move um, closer to protecting more farmland, I think we've all seen the energy around the farm to table movement, local food, and farmers markets. And this has really led to vibrant urban centers. You know, farm to table restaurants and farmers markets are great um, catalysts and drivers of urban vibrancy. So the more vibrant your urban area is, the less pressure there is to expand out into your rural area. So we want to say save the best, but don't forget the rest. Great. Thank you so much, Billy. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, while we give people a minute um, for questions, let me um, also let us launch one last poll um, to inform the work that we want to be doing through our National Agricultural Land Network. Um, this will help us again in our programming in terms of the type of programming that people would like to see. Um, so let me stop there for a minute. Okay, Beth, what are the, what are we seeing here? Okay, well that is, um, again, it's great to see that there's a lot of interest in what those planning tools are um, as well as conservation easements generally and state and local policy tools. So um, uh, we will get that to, to that in one minute talking about the network. But um, let me ask one more question here. Um, the question is how does um, AFT imagine using for itself or others, the nationally significant land data layer. Um, I'll start that, and then Billy, if you want to offer your perspectives, that would be great. Um, for us thinking about it at the federal policy level, here's one way that we imagine using it. There's a thing that is um, the Federal Farmland Protection Policy Act, um, which focuses on trying to encourage federal agencies um, to have as small a footprint as possible in their infrastructure development. That policy act um, doesn't really have much teeth to it. It is simply a notification, but because of that process, we actually know that there's been a lot of development through federally funded projects. And one way that we could imagine using it is to think about changes to that act where you would really encourage federal agencies and their funded projects to avoid that nationally significant land. Again, we appreciate that all 
agricultural land has um, value um, and many different types of co-benefits, but if we're thinking about trying to shrink the footprint of infrastructure development around the country, that might be one way. And so similarly, in thinking about it at the state level, looking at those two data layers of nationally significant land and the North Carolina's best land is the way we characterized land that was at the upper end of those PDR values. Again, would be thinking about in siting various types of infrastructure, and that is I'm thinking about renewable energy infrastructure um, and solar in particular. We appreciate that solar development is a valuable source of funding and a source of energy for um, farmers, but in thinking about large-scale solar development, again, trying to find ways to keep it off of what that most productive land is or to do dual use for that. Um, so let me turn it over to Billy for any other thoughts on that question. Thank you, or Chris. Director Hardy. Director Hardy, uh, would you like to go ahead? Uh, I would kind of echo the sentiments that we need to do planning on a policy level that will allow us to use these resources to target them to protect the more valuable lands. You, you mentioned the solar farms, for example. Solar energy is, a, is can be a significant usage of, of energy development, but the, the use of those solar panels uh, spread across a very protective fertile field is not the very best use of that farmland. Whereas if it was located in I will say less productive soils or brown field sites, things of, the, of that caliber, it'd be more beneficial and, and serve a, a, a greater purpose. And then if you look at our policies across, as far as directing our, protecting our natural resources of farmland, as you look at the map where development is, et cetera, planning with the county government governments to increase the protection of those viable viable or more uh, vulnerable areas of natural resources of land that are used for food and fiber production. In North Carolina, 90% of the land privately owned. So you have to have those incentive policies on a voluntary basis that allows that private landowner to want to participate, to want to have that land protected. So our policies of what you were talking about, not only at the state level, but at the federal level, influence what's occurring. So we need to have that communication from the top to the bottom, from the local county, all the way to the state, all the way to the federal agencies in a collaborative action and mode. Thank you. Thank you, Director Hardy. I'll just add that Mapping as much of our protected farmland, our nationally significant land, and our productive, versatile, and resilient land is part of an overall strategy to, to uh, plan for the future of agriculture on a state level and on a regional level. So we're talking about regional food systems. So we need to plan regionally for where farmland will be, where key agricultural operations will be, but also where other forms of economic development will take place. And so that's where I think when we say save the best, but don't forget the rest, um, we have to plan for the future of agriculture in addition to planning for other types of growth. And so um, planning regionally is part of that. But at the local level, each community should embed a goal of farmland protection in their county as part of their comprehensive planning process. And it should be um, ingrained as a guide, guidepost for the entire goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. And one example that I can note is developing an overall rural area land management plan where all aspects of the rural area are evaluated and it becomes a guiding document for all of agriculture, including 
protected lands, historic cultural resources, environmentally sensitive areas, blue line streams, scenic view sheds, and, and other. But that's one of the reasons why having the most information on this map as possible is critically important and embedding a goal of protected farmland in the comprehensive planning process so that that's where you start, that's your big overarching goal and objective, and that's where the rest of the conversation starts. If we're gonna protect this much land, here's where we can develop other non-agricultural uses in our urban core, but this PVR land and nationally significant land, that's what we're gonna protect for the future of agriculture. And I was, I know Director Hardy is very familiar with AFT's cost of community services studies and agriculture uses less in services than it pays in taxes and the urban core uses less in services than it pays in taxes. Sprawl uses more in services than it pays in taxes and it's an unsustainable model financially and environmentally. So Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Billy. So let's close by um, just talking for a minute about two types of resources that AFT is um, focused on the, to help partners around the country in addressing um, both retaining and protecting ag land. The first is the Farmland Information Center, which has been around for quite a long time. It, it is run in collaboration with USDA's Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, and it is a wonderful resource base. Uh, it is a website. It is a technical assistance hotline. You can call that number for any kind of question. If you want to know about a statistic around number of senior farmers that might be in North Carolina or the number of, I don't know, acres in a particular type of commodity. Um, you can find all that type of information very quickly at the Farmland Information Center. It is a repository of state policies and state statutes there is information on there, and it is expanding around the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program. Many of the documents required for application to that are going up very shortly on the website. Um, so it is also a resource for um, farmers and landowners. So if you know of farmers who are looking for information about how do I protect um, a, a farm, um, it that shows them the way. We also have a way of pointing farmers and landowners to local land trusts. So know for those of you who are land trusts on the phone that we are providing that information to landowners when they call in. Um, the National Agricultural Land Network is newly launched. It is American Farmland Trust formalizing a role that we have played since our establishment in 1980 of wanting to provide technical support, um, training, educational resources to all of those who are working on farm and ranch land protection and those who are working on planning around agriculture. It is a membership entity, it's a membership network. The membership is free. It is intended for professionals in this space, so not necessarily for farmers and ranchers and landowners directly, unless you are playing an active role in your local or county or state uh, advisory boards or focused on planning. Um, we are, as I've talked about earlier, we are going to be doing a series of policy webinars that will be followed with um, a number of different types of trainings. We are going to go from basic farmland protection 101 to conversations with some of the most um, experienced partners in farm and ranch land protection focusing on some particular challenges. What are some of the issues now around writing the 
right type of agricultural conservation easement? How do we incorporate farmland access into our agricultural land protection work? How do we work with farmers of protected land on thinking about soil health? So we have a number of um, plans for the network. We hope that everybody on this call will join us. You can see that there's the, the link here that provides you um, a link to the page where you can learn more and you can sign up. So I hope everybody will make use of that. Um, it's intended to be a resource for all of the folks of the type who are on this um, webinar. And I will stop there and turn it back to you, Billy, for the last word. Thank you, Chris. And I want to thank all of our partners for being on the call today. I can be reached by email at bbanpelt at farmland.org. And I'm also available on LinkedIn. I welcome the opportunity to connect with you professionally and continue this conversation. And a very special thank you again to Director Hardy for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate um, you being on the phone, you offering your perspectives, um, and for all that the department is doing to support farmers and farmland protection. Thank you on behalf of Commissioner Troxer from the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. Hey, good afternoon all. <laughs>